All right, this morning I had announced of a new preaching series that I'm going to be going through, and that is on the subject of eschatology, or end times Bible prophecy. This morning's sermon had to do with the identification of the great whore. I also this morning had announced that tonight's sermon as well is going to be a part two of what we spoke about this morning, and that is identifying the great whore. This morning, sermon, put it to rest. That was enough. There's no way out of it. There's only one city that is responsible for killing the apostles and the prophets, which is Jerusalem. There's only one city that has done that. There's only one city that Jesus says he was going to send the prophets and the apostles to. And then when we look at Revelation chapter number 18, the Bible point blank tells you that she is guilty of spilling the blood of the apostles and the prophets. So that, that alone is game over, but I am just going to beat a dead horse tonight. Amen. I am going to show you multitudes of prophecies that are fulfilled. I am going to show you multitudes of, of identifications, if you will, of characteristics of the great whore that prove that it can only be the city of Jerusalem, the end time city of Jerusalem. I want to review quickly with one of the main points or the main point from this morning that proves that it is Jerusalem. And I want to show you the similarity in wording of one particular, of, of two passages comparing the two. And that is Matthew chapter number 23, verse number 35. The Bible says this, that upon you may come all the, the righteous bloodshed, Jesus speaking to Jerusalem, that upon you may come all the righteous bloodshed upon the earth from the blood of righteous Abel under the blood of Zacharias, son of Berechias, whom ye slew between the temple and the altar. We look at this verse as well this morning. But I want to home in on the similarities. Revelation 18, 24 says this. And in her was found the blood of the prophets and of the saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. So did you notice that? The first part of Matthew 23, 35 says this. That upon you may come all the righteous bloodshed upon the earth. That upon you may come all the righteous bloodshed upon the earth. 18, 24. And in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints. Now listen to this. And of all that were slain upon the earth. That's much too similar to be a coincidence. And obviously we saw that they, they uh, murdered the apostles. The last apostle was Paul. They were all sent there. Peter died. I'm not going to review the whole entire sermon, but it's very clear that, that, that the great war is Jerusalem. Amen. Now, I want you to look at Revelation 17 in the beginning portion of this chapter. And I will look there in verse number 1. Begin reading. And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Verse 3, So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman, excuse me, sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. Verse 5. And upon her forehead was, the name, was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Just in those first five verses, we see her repeatedly referred to as a whore. We see her repeatedly referred to as a harlot, right? And then also, what is another word that continually is used? Fornication, correct? If you look in the Old Testament, there's only one city over and over and over again that is called a whore. There's only one city over and over and over again in the entire Bible that is called a harlot. Do you know who it is? Take a guess. <laughs> Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem. Yeah. Now, people want to just ignore this fact. I want you to turn to Jeremiah chapter number 3, verse number 8. People just want to ignore this fact that there's a purpose or a reason why she is called the great whore. There's a reason why it's said that she is committing fornication. God made a covenant with the nation of Israel in the Old Testament. God likens that covenant unto marriage. Himself, he being the husband, and Israel being the wife. Repeatedly throughout the Old Testament, they would fall into uh, you know, infidelity or unfaithfulness where they would leave the one and only true God and stop serving Him and they would, they would begin serving false gods and they would begin serving idols. And do you know what God says that they are doing every time? That they are going whoring. He says that you are being a harlot. He says that they are committing fornication and that they are committing adultery. 
This is a repeated theme throughout all of the Old Testament. <clears throat> Hosea chapter number 4 verse 15 says this, Though thou, Israel, play the harlot, yet let not Judah offend, and come not ye unto, Gal uh, unto Gilgal. You're in Jeremiah chapter number 3 verse number 8. Let me get there myself. Jeremiah chapter number 3 verse number 8. This right here details and explains why God repeatedly will refer to her as a harlot. But I was just explaining to you myself. Look at Jeremiah chapter 3 verse number 8. It says, And I saw when for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery. And, had, and, he said, and he says, I had put her away and given her a bill of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not, but went, look at this, and played the harlot also. So here we get the, book, the, the big picture where he actually says in this passage that they committed adultery. You can see that he's liking it under marriage. She's the woman, and she goes, and she's being a whore. She's being a harlot. I believe verse 9 actually gives us more light on it. Yes, it does. And it came to pass through the lightness of, of her whoredom that she defiled the land and committed adultery. Look at this, with stones and with stocks. So what, what are they doing that is the, the act of adultery? It's worshiping another god. It's worshiping a false god and it's praising, you know, the works of man, man's hands, right? Uh, I'm going to read another one to you. Isaiah chapter number 1, verse number 21, it says this. How is the faithful city become an harlot? It was full of judgment, righteousness lodged in it, but now murders. You hear that? How is the faithful city become an harlot? Over and over and over again, God likens Jerusalem, the city of the Jews, the country, the nation of the Jews, unto being a harlot and to being a whore. And what's the reason? What's the purpose? Because they're going a whoring after other gods, right? The, the most famous chapter, if you, if you want to look up a chapter where the word whore or harlot is used the most, then anybody know what it is? Ezekiel 16. Do you know what he's talking about? It's not a literal woman. It's figurative of Jerusalem. It's figurative of Israel. It's figurative of Judah. And he calls them over and over again. You're a whore. You're a harlot. He says, wherefore thou harlot, O thou harlot, repeatedly. I'm going to read to you one thing that's very interesting of what we read earlier. I'm going to give you little, little uh, you know, nuggets of truths of prophecies fulfilled as we go through points. The first point we're looking at here is why she's called a whore, why she's called a harlot in the first place. Turn over to Ezekiel chapter number 16, 30, uh, verse number 35 quickly. A lot of these are going to be in Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. So Ezekiel, as I said, chapter 16, which I was just referencing, I want you to look at this in Ezekiel 16, verse number 35. The Bible says, Wherefore, O harlot, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, because thy filthiness was poured out, and thy nakedness discovered, through thy whoredoms, with thy lovers, and with all the idols of thy abominations, and by the blood of thy children, which thou didst give unto them. Because they're sacrificing their children unto, unto idols. It says in verse 37, Behold, therefore, I will gather all thy lovers with whom thou hast taken pleasure, and all them that thou hast loved, with all them that thou, I'm sorry, with all them that thou hast hated, I will even gather them round about against thee, and will discover thy nakedness unto them, that they may see all thy nakedness. Uh, Revelation chapter number 17, verse number 5, tells you, it says, And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, and it says, The mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Jeremiah chapter number 3, verse number 3, when God is speaking unto Israel, says this, Therefore the showers have been withholden, and there hath been no latter rain, and thou hast a whore's forehead, thou refusest, to be ashamed. How much more can God say you have a whore's forehead when you got whore or harlot written on your forehead? I mean, your, your forehead can't be that even more so a, a whore's forehead when you got whore or harlot written on your forehead. Okay, I want you to turn to, um, I have you turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. Actually, no, no, I'll let you look at these. Jeremiah chapter number 5. Go to Jeremiah chapter number 5 in your left hand. So, Throughout this sermon, I'm going to have you in your left hand have a major prophet. Because as I mentioned, a lot of our references are going to be Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. So in your Bible, these would be considered the major prophets. And But we're also in your right hand, I want you to have Revelation. So we'll go back and forth and we're going to be doing this a few times. Because there are so many references. There are so many fulfilled prophecies. There are so many characteristics that point us back to one city every single time. The same city. 
which be which is Jerusalem. That Kentucky coming out of me. Which be which be Jerusalem? Look at uh, Revelation chapter number eighteen, verse number two. Revelation chapter number eighteen, verse number two. The Bible says this about the great whore, and he cried mightily with a with a strong voice, saying, "Babylon the great is fallen." Is fallen and has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and faithful bird. Look over at, uh, as I mentioned, Jeremiah chapter number 5, verse number 25. I, I believe this is the right passage. Yes, it is. Jeremiah 5, 25, it says, Your iniquities have turned away these things, and your sins have withholden good things from you. He's referring to, he's speaking to Israel right now. If you want to get the context, he says afterwards, verse 26, For among my people are found wicked men. They lay wait as he that setteth snares. They set a trap. They catch men. Watch this. As a cage is, filled, is full of birds, so are their houses full of deceit. Therefore they are become great and waxen rich. Did you catch that? As a cage is full of birds, so are their houses full of deceit. Revelation chapter number 18, verse 2, one more time. It says that become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Go to 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. Also in verse number 2 it says, I want you to notice that wording. It says, and he cried mightily with a strong voice saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen. And then it says this. And it's become the habitation of devils. What does it mean to become something? It means you used to not be that. What did it say in Isaiah chapter number 1, verse number 21 that I just read a mo moment ago? It said, that how is the faithful city become an harlot? Saying it used to not be a harlot. Saying it used to be a faithful city. It used to not be the habitation of devils. But guess what? It's become the habitation of devils and of every foul spirit and of every unclean and hateful bird. Right. You can see the downfall <clears throat> being spoken of there. I don't want to miss any of these. Uh, we, did we turn to Ezekiel 1635? We're moving fast. Too fast for myself. We did not? Okay. H have we turned already? Does anybody remember? Ezekiel 16? Nobody thinks so? Okay. Yeah, we, did. Yeah. we did. Okay. I thought we did. Uh, okay. 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. I want to give you another point real quick. 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. So that was the reason why... It's called a whore. It's called a harlot. There's only one other city in the Bible that's called a whore. There's only one other city called a harlot. You have to meet certain qualifications. You have to have a husband and you've got to go whoring around on him. That's the whole point why she's called a whore. That's the whole point why we see Israel in the Old Testament called a harlot because they broke the covenant with God. They're, that's why they're committing fornication because they are cheating on God, right? In obviously a figurative sense. So 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. I want to make a, just a couple of real quick points on this. 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2, verse number 3, or I'm sorry, verse, yeah, verse number 3, that is correct. It speaks of the Antichrist, and it tells you a, 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 uh, a fact about, about the Antichrist when he comes, what he's going to do. It says in verse number 3, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed. That's the Antichrist. That man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. And then watch what it says. Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped. So that he as God sitteth in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. Now I have layer upon layer because we just got done with the Trinity. I want to, I want to throw something at you real quick. We have the Antichrist, right? He's trying to pretend to be the Christ, right? He's trying to come in and rule from Jerusalem where the Christ is going to rule from, correct? And who's he saying he wants to be? He as God. How many people is he? He's one person. Guess what he's saying? I'm going to be God. There's only one that goes there and sits down. Right. And how many thrones are in heaven? One. You see right. the consistency? How does that even make sense? Yeah. You understand what I mean? Obviously, the devil who was the covering cherubim, he knows. He knows there's one throne in heaven. So that's just a, a little nugget, a kind of side nugget there. Not only that... It says, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worship, worship, so that he as God, this is important, sitteth in the temple of God. So where is the Antichrist going to set up shop? In Jerusalem. in Jerusalem. Now I want you to think about this. Jerusalem, or let's say Mystery Babylon. Let's just hypo speak hypothetical for a minute. Mystery Babylon, the great whore, right? Mystery Babylon, end times Babylon. 
you know, uh, she, if you will, is she is uh, pretending to be that, you know, she wants to be, uh, you know, uh, it's a counterfeit is what I'm trying to say. It's an imitation, right? It's a counterfeit and she wants to try to fool people. The devil goes there, and he goes and sets up there. And we see in the Old Testament, when we compare the Old Testament to the New Testament, I lost my train of thought, but now I, I know what I was getting ready to say. When we compare the Old Testament to the New Testament, we can see similarities, okay, between Old Testament Babylon and between New Testament Babylon, right? Because the whole point is that New Testament Babylon is a figure. It's not literal. It's a, it's a picture. It's like in ways. Does that mean that it's like in every way? No. Are there any like spiritual figures that are exactly like in every single way? So let me make one point before I make my primary point right there. Okay, that means, and this is what a lot of people do, like United States of America, Roman Catholic Church. What they'll do is they'll go back to Old Testament Babylon. They'll go back to the real picture of it. And they'll try to, you know, uh, use points of Old Testament Babylon, of Nebuchadnezzar, of who, whatever, you know, the points are. That support whatever theory they already believe. You know, we, but but that doesn't mean that it, that New Testament Babylon, that spiritual Babylon, has those characteristics. We don't. We we have to look at New Testament Babylon in the New Testament. We have to look at spiritual Babylon, end times Babylon. We have to see what the Bible tells us how she is like. We don't just go to Old Testament Babylon and everything of how Old Testament Babylon is like. That's how. It is because that's when people start to get deceitful. That's when they start to just, oh, you know, Old Testament Babylon has this characteristic. So, and that's kind of like what I, and here's one of the things that people have said that, well, that means that there's just going to be full of idols. Now, in the, in the New Testament, outside of the idol that is set up, the abomination of desolation, which there may be multiple of this one idol that people have to worship, does the Bible say that it's a country of idols in the New Testament? It never says that one time. Not one single time. There are similarities and there is a likeness of the Old Testament Babylon, but you don't just get to pick and choose whatever lines up with your theory. You understand what I'm saying? We go with the characteristics of the great whore of the New Testament. We use those Amen. to prove our theory. Does everyone understand what I'm saying? But we see the likeness of Nebuchadnezzar with the Antichrist. We can see that clearly, right? He sets up an idol in the Old Testament. And what does he do? He tells people to worship it. If you don't worship it, you can go in the fire. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? He's going to kill them, right? We see that clear likeness of, of Nebuchadnezzar, and that would be who? The Antichrist. His Babylon that he had at that time, physical, literal Babylon, and then spiritual Babylon in the end times. People try, want to try to get you. People with this United States of America foolishness, they want to try to get you to believe. That the Antichrist is in Jerusalem, in the temple in Jerusalem, but the great whore is the United States of America? Come on. He go. where does he go? Where are you? When the prophets are sent, where are they sent? They're sent in the heat of the battle, buddy. The prophets are sent to preach where the Antichrist is, and then he has them killed. Why? Because that is the central point of power, wherever the Antichrist is. That's the hub of power. Where, where did Nebuchadnezzar... Did Nebuchadnezzar reign in the Old Testament from a different city other than Babylon? No, Nebuchadnezzar was located where? In the city of Babylon. That's where he was located. So when we get to the New Testament and we see the Antichrist as a picture of Nebuchadnezzar, I don't even know logically how you could, how you could make the, try to make the claim that he's reigning from Jerusalem, but the great whore? He's, the great whore is riding the beast, which is... Does that even make sense? The great whore is riding the beast. Does anybody get what I'm saying? It makes zero sense. But, but thousands and thousands of miles away, that's really the great whore. But he's way over on the other side of the country. Snap out of it, my friend. Right. That's foolishness. That's stupid. It makes zero sense. Right. It's dumb. Amen. And, and it has zero support. So that's why I have to say, let me look at the United States of America. Let's find any characteristic that we can that applies from the Old Testament Babylon. Hey, we're not talking about Old Testament Babylon. Everything's not the same. Do you understand? Only certain similarities are drawn to the New Testament. And that's why we go to the New Testament, we find the characteristics, and then we use the Bible to tell us who that is. Right. Everyone understand what I'm saying? And where does it say in Daniel 11, like we read earlier, I think I actually have it here. Daniel chapter number 11 again tells you that he goes, he sets up his palace in the holy city. 
Daniel chapter number 11, verse 36. This may not be that exact passage. Oh, this is what that's quoting, what we just read. Daniel eleven thirty six 36 says this, And the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods, and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished, for that is determined shall be done. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of any man, for he shall magnify himself above all, above all, above all. I, I forgot to include this. Give me just a moment. It's Daniel. You can turn there if you don't mind. Daniel chapter number 11. It's the end of Daniel 11. The very end of Daniel 11, what we read earlier today. Daniel 11, 44 says this, But tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him, Therefore he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly to make away many. Verse 45, and he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas in the glorious holy mountain. Obviously a clear reference to Jerusalem, the mountain of Jerusalem. And where is he? Again, where is he setting up? Where's the central point of power? The holy mountain, which is what? It's Jerusalem. So it doesn't even make sense. That the great whore is all the way on the other side of the country. The great whore is riding the beast, but the beast is thousands of miles away. I mean, come on. That's silliness. That's foolishness. Right. Have you turned to another passage here? This is very interesting. Go to Revelation chapter number 15. Revelation chapter number 15. So we're just going to look at all the different evidence that points to being Jerusalem. Revelation chapter number 15. Re Revelation chapter number 15. KK, get down your water. Revelation chapter number 15. Verse number 1, it says this, And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the, the number of his name, Stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. So the rapture just took place, right? All saved believers, right, that made it through. <clears throat> thank you. All saved believers that made it through to the end, they're raptured. All of the bodies of those that, made, that had lived, they're all in heaven. Everybody's in heaven. Right now they have their body as well. Their soul was there prior. And they're standing there in heaven, and the plagues are getting ready to be poured out. A plague has not been poured out yet. God's wrath has not officially begun yet. He's getting ready to start pouring out his wrath, the seven plagues, it says, the seven last plagues. <clears throat> real quick, i got a lot to cover, but I want to say this real fast. A lot of people think, and some people may know where I'm going right now, a lot of people think that there are seven trumpets and that there are seven vials, and then that they are uh, different. A lot of people will say that they are, you know, they're occurring concurrently at the same time, seven vials and seven, seven trumpets. And they're not the same. That's false. That's not correct. Number one, when you compare them, they're almost identical. But I can prove to you without a shadow of doubt from this passage that there is only one set of those. Verse number 15, or chapter 15, verse 1 says, And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous. And it says, Seven angels having, look at this, the seven last plagues. Now, he is seeing this for the second time. Does everyone understand what I'm saying? He watched it one time from beginning to end. Now he's watching it again from beginning to end. Does everyone, everyone understand what I'm saying? Now, people that believe that concurrently there are two, two sets of plagues being poured out, they, they wouldn't be able to handle this verse with that type of interpretation. And the reason is you couldn't look at one set and say those are the seven last plagues. Because what about the other seven? Does everyone understand what I'm saying? You couldn't look at the seven plagues that are the trumpets and say, hey, these are the seven last plagues that are going to be poured out of God's wrath. You couldn't say that because there's another seven right over here. When that one's poured out, this one's poured out too. There's another plague that, that wasn't included. There's only the, 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 the trumpet. I don't know how it works exactly, but maybe one angel pour, uh, blows the trumpet and then another angel has the vial and pours the vial out, but they're exactly the same. And the further proof of that is when you compare them. They're affecting the same things. Of course, there are slight differences, but when you read the Gospels, they're slightly different too, aren't they? But it's the same story. Does everyone understand what I'm saying? You couldn't call them the seven last plagues if there are seven other plagues that are being poured out at the time. You, couldn't, you can't use that language. That's incorrect then. That was totally off topic. But notice verse number three. It says this. And they, that's those that were saved. That's the, the believers, right? 
And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Notice this is the song of the Lamb. And then he says, right after that, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. That's because the Lamb is the Lord God Almighty, who is what he's referred to as him that sitteth on the throne. I want you to keep your hand here. Actually, you don't even need your hand here. You, I want you to go back to Deuteronomy, where the song of Moses is actually sung. Now, this is extremely significant. You may not have ever noticed this, but in the book of Deuteronomy, it actually tells you what the song of, of Moses is. And it actually tells you the lyrics of the song of Moses in the book of Deuteronomy. In Deuteronomy, I think it's 31... 32, I believe, is where they sing it. And then 31 is when he tells you, you know, he tells you about the song. And he tells you something very significant about the song. And the reason why they are to sing the song. At the end of Deuteronomy 31, he tells them that there is a particular reason and that there is a particular time in which they will sing the song. Look at the end of Deuteronomy 31 and verse number 28. He says, Gather unto me all the elders of your tribes and your officers, speaking to Israel, of course, that I may speak these words in their ears and call heaven and earth to record against them. There you see a literal word-bearing record, by the way. Verse number 29, For I know that after my death you will utterly corrupt, corrupt yourselves. Who's he speaking to? Israel, right? He says, After my death you will utterly corrupt yourselves. And turn aside from the way which I have commanded you. And he says this, and evil will befall you in the, what? Latter days. Who's he speaking to? Keep this in mind. Jerusalem. He's speaking to Israel. In the latter days, because you will do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger through the work of your hands. Verse 30. And Moses spake in the ears of all the congregation of Israel the words of this song until they were ended. He tells you two things. Number one, this song is going to be saying in the end times, right? He says the latter days. And what's the reason why they're singing the song? Because they have corrupted themselves and they've done evil. And he says, and at that time, evil is going to befall you. What is, what is the timing of when they choose to sing that song? Right before that, what happens? The vials are given out. The vials are distributed, Right? Look at Deuteronomy chapter 32. Look at verse number 1. It says this. <clears throat> We're going to read through some of this. A couple of these statements are extremely interesting. Give ear, O you heavens, and I will speak. And hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. My doctrine shall drop as the rain. My speech shall distill as the dew, as the small rain upon the tender herb, and as the showers upon the grass. Because I will publish the name of the Lord, ascribe ye greatness unto our God. I want to pause real quick. Another point I want to make earlier. Did you notice this, this was the song of Moses and the song of what? The Lamb. The Lamb. Do you understand what's going on here? What they're doing? Praising God. They're praising the Lord repeatedly. Look at verse number four. He is the rock. Who? God in the context, but who's the rock always? Christ. Christ. He is the rock. His work is perfect. For all his ways are judgment. A God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he. Now watch this. They have corrupted themselves. Now, who corrupted themselves just previous to this? Israel. He said, you're going to corrupt yourselves and you're going to go aside. He says, they have corrupted themselves. Their spot, look at this, is not the spot of his children. Do you know what he's talking about? He's talking about physical Israel. It says, their spot is not the spot of his children. Look at verse 5. They are perverse and crooked generation. What does Jesus call them? Crooked generation. Speaking to the Jews. Perverse and crooked generation, do ye thus requite the Lord, O foolish people and unwise? Is not he thy father that hath bought thee? Hath he not made thee and established thee? Remember the days of old, consider the years of many generations. Ask thy father. He's talking to the Israelites right now. Right? And when are they pouring out that, when, when are they uh, singing this song? Right before the wrath is poured out upon Israel. Now, th that's important for one reason. I'm going to get to it in just a minute. I want to keep reading. I'll, I'll tell you that in just a minute. So he says, remember the days of old, verse 7. Consider the years of many generations. Ask thy father and he will show thee. Thy elders and they will tell thee. When the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number 
of the children of Israel. For the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. He found him in a desert land and in the waste, howling wilderness. He led him about. He instructed him. He kept him as the apple of his eye. As an eagle stirreth up her nest, fluttereth over her young, spreadeth abroad her wings, taketh them, beareth them on her wings, so the Lord alone did lead him, and there was no strange God with him. He made him ride on the high places of the earth, and that he might eat the, the increase of the fields. And he made him to suck honey out of the rock, and oil out of the flinty rock, butter of kine, and milk of sheep. So he's talking about how he established Israel when he blessed Israel in the beginning. Butter of kine and milk of sheep with fat of lambs and rams of the breed of Bashan and goats with the fat kidneys of wheat. And thou didst drink the pure blood of the, the grape. But Jeshurun waxed fat and kicked. Thou art waxen fat. Thou art grown thick. Thou art covered with fatness. Then he forsook God which made him and lightly esteemed the rock of his salvation. Talk about Israel leaving the Lord. Keep looking. Verse 16. They provoked him to jealousy with strange gods, with abominations, provoked they him to anger. Notice that it says they provoked him to jealousy. Jealousy is used only two times in the Bible. Do you know it's both times? What person, type of person it's used to refer to? God. And then who? A husband. Do you know why he's using it here? Because they broke the covenant. Because this is his wife, if you will. And he says that he's jealous over them. Right? He said that jealousy was strange gods, but abominations provoked they him to anger. They sacrificed unto idols, not to God, to gods whom they knew not, to new gods that came newly up, whom your fathers feared not. Of the rock that begat thee, thou art unmindful and hast forgotten God that formed thee. And when the Lord saw it, he abhorred them because of the provoking of his sons and of his daughters. And he said, I will hide my face from them. And I will see what their end shall be, for they are very froward. They were a very froward generation, children, in whom is no faith. One thing that this does is it destroys the false teaching that Israel will someday return to God. Because he says right here, I will hide from them and I'm going to destroy them. He's talking about how he's going to punish them, and this is specific to the end times. Now, I don't want to lose you here because we're reading a lot of text, but keep paying attention. Keep paying attention because there's a couple of verses here. I'm, I'm reading this. I want to set the stage, and then you'll get these couple of verses. So he says, they moved me to jealousy with that which is not God. Verse 21, they have provoked me to anger with their vanities, and I will move them to jealousy with those which are not a people. I want to pause right there for just a moment. A very great truth that's found in this. He says, they moved me to jealousy with their false gods, so I'm going to move them to jealousy with those that are not a people. Who's that a reference to? Exactly. And here's the thing. When, when they're singing the song of Moses, do you know who's singing that song? It's everybody in heaven. It's the true Israel. Do you know who they're singing it about? Israel on the earth. Those who say there are Jews and they are not. Do you understand that? It says they in heaven are who's singing the song and they're testifying against those that are not. They, those that were not a people are singing that song about those that were the true Israel of the Old Testament as far as the, the first covenant, the old covenant, right? Keep looking at this. He says, it provoked them to anger with a foolish nation, for a fire is kindled in mine anger. Look, now he starts talking about the punishments. I want you to pay attention. For a fire is kindled in my anger and shall burn under the lowest hell and, can sh and shall consume the earth with her increase and set on fire the foundations of the mountains. I will heap mischiefs upon them. I will spend mine arrows upon them. They shall be burnt with hunger and devoured with burning heat and with bitter destruction. Notice these plagues that he's mentioning. I will also send the teeth of beasts upon them. Watch this. With poison of serpents of the dust. Now I'm going to read to you quickly a reference that I have to that. Revelation chapter number 9 verse number 17. One of the plagues. <clears throat> And thus I saw the horses in the vision, and them that sat on them, having breastplates of fire and of Jason and brimstone, and the heads of horses were the heads of lions. And, of, and out of their mouths issued fire and smoke and brimstone. By these three was the third part of men killed by the fire, by the smoke, and by the brimstone, which issued out of their mouths. Then it says this, For their power is in their mouth, and in their tails, and it says, For their tail, tails were like unto serpents, and had heads, and with them... They do hurt. Notice that's one of the plagues that are poured out. And what is going on before they sing the song? They're getting the plagues ready right before those plagues are about to be poured out. You go back and you, sing, you, you read the lyrics of the song of Moses. 
And he tells you one of those, one of the things that he's going to do to them in the latter days when they turn away from him. It says there in verse 24, he says, I will also send the teeth of beasts upon them. And then he says, with, uh, he says, with the poison of serpents of the dust. And one of those beasts has a tail like a serpent and it stings them and it bites them. Not only that, verse 25, the sword without and terror within shall destroy both the young man and the virgin, the suckling also with the man of gray hairs. So I want to skip this because I don't want to lose everybody with all this amount of text. I know it's, it can be hard to pay attention. Go to verse 43. Verse number 43. You'll notice this. We'll read verse 42. He says, I will make my arrows drunk with blood and my sword shall devour flesh and that with the blood of the slain of the captives from the beginning of revenges upon the enemy. Verse 43, watch this. Rejoice, O ye nations, with his people, for he will avenge the blood of his servants and will render vengeance to his adversaries and will be merciful unto his land. And it says, and to his people. But it's not the people he's singing the song to or singing the song about. Do you understand that? They're the ones being punished. Who's actually singing the song? Those that are in heaven. If you've forgotten so quickly, Revelation chapter number 18, verse number 20 says this. Rejoice over her, thou heaven, and ye holy apostles and prophets, for God hath avenged you on her. Almost a direct quote from Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 43. Rejoice, O ye nations, with his people, for he will avenge the blood of his servants and will render vengeance to his adversaries and will be merciful unto his land and to his people. Amen. Speaking unto Israel, that he's going to punish Israel in the end times. You know one of the plagues it says specifically? That the plague is poured out upon, it says, uh, the kingdom of the beast or the seed of the beast along those lines. Do you know why? He can punish. It doesn't matter. Those plagues are all over the world. I agree with you. But the beast kingdom is the whole world at that time. And it is the false religion of Judaism. Because he sets up shop, as I've said so many times, in Jerusalem. He goes into the temple, and the false religion of Judaism becomes the religion of the entire world. He claims that he's the Messiah of the Old Testament scriptures, of the Bible. He says that he is the Christ, and that you should worship him. That you should worship him, and what does he do? He makes a world religion that, if you don't worship me, I'm going to kill you. God ultimately punishes you know, all those that are on the earth... And he says that he's revenging the blood of his apostles, of his servants. And that was prophesied in the Old Testament. And notice when this song is sang, when they sing this song. When is it? It's sung right before the plagues begin to be poured out. Why? Because the kingdom that's set up at that time is a, is a wicked kingdom where the Antichrist is reigning from the temple. And he's claiming that it is that which is of God, right? He's claiming that he is the Messiah of the Old Testament. I want you to turn to another passage. So that's real significant there. We see the Song of Moses is saying at a particular time. I want you to go to Revelation chapter number 17, verse number 16. Now this right here is huge. So get Revelation chapter number 17, verse number 16 in your right hand. Revelation chapter number 17, verse number 16 in your right hand. And I want you to get Ezekiel chapter number 16, verse number 38. In your left hand. Whoops. Ezekiel chapter number 16, verse number 38 in your left hand. So Revelation 17, verse 16 actually tells you how the great whore is going to be destroyed. What her destruction is. And it tells you this in verse 16. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh and burn her. With fire. So notice that. They're going to hate the whore. She's a whore. They're going to hate her. They're going to make her desolate, naked. They're going to eat her flesh. They're going to burn her with fire. Go over to Ezekiel chapter number 16. Ezekiel chapter number 16. I want you to look at verse number 38. He says, And I will judge thee as women, as women that break wedlock and shed blood are judged. Notice that. In the chapter where he's calling her a whore, he's saying, you broke wedlock against me, and I'm going to judge you, right? And I will give thee blood in fury and in jealousy. Verse 39, and I will also give thee into their hand, and they shall throw down thine eminent place, and shall break down thy high places. Watch this. They shall strip thee also of thy clothes, and shall take thy fair jewels, look at this, and leave thee naked and bare. This is Jerusalem of the Old Testament. Look at verse 40. 
They shall also bring up a company against thee. Who is going to come against her in the, in the New Testament, the spiritual Babylon? The ten kings. The armies of the ten kings. They shall also bring up a company against thee, and they shall stone thee with stones and thrust thee through with swords. Look at verse 41. 41. And they shall burn thine houses with fire. That sound familiar? Naked and desolate and burn you with fire. Look what it says next. They shall, uh, I'm sorry, they shall burn thine houses with fire and execute judgments upon thee in the sight of many women, and I will cause thee to cease from playing the harlot. And thou, and thou also shalt give no hire anymore. So will I make my fury toward thee to rest, and my jealousy shall depart from thee, and I will be quiet and will be no more angry, because thou hast not remembered the days of thy youth, but hast fretted me in all these things. Behold, therefore, I will also recompense thy way upon thine head, saith the Lord God. And thou shalt not commit this lewdness above all thine abominations. You look at the chapter in the Bible that uses the word whore and harlot the most. And it's talking about a city, not a person. And it's talking about the city, specifically, of Jerusalem. And in that same chapter, when he's calling her a whore, when he's referring to her as a her, he tells him, hey, do you know how I'm going to destroy you? Do you know what your destruction is going to be? I'm going to make you naked. I'm going to make you desolate, and I'm going to bring up a company of armies against you, and I'm going to burn you with fire. You get to the New Testament, a whore is talked about as being a city. Do you know how she's destroyed? She's made naked, she's made desolate, and guess what else? She's burned with fire. And how does it all happen? These ten kings shall hate the whore, and then they come against her, a company. I mean, come on. It's so clear. Amen. Go in your Bibles. Let's look at more fulfilled prophecy here. Actually, stay in Ezekiel. Go to Ezekiel chapter 23. Go to Ezekiel chapter 23, verse number 22. Ezekiel chapter number 23, verse number 22. It says again, Therefore, O Aholabah, thou thus, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will raise up thy lovers against thee, from whom thy mind is alienated, and I will bring them against thee on every side. That's exactly what takes place because there's a covenant made with those ten kings. And guess what happens? Then they come against her. They're just using her. What is a whore? Somebody you're just using. Right? And then the ten kings come against her and then destroy her. It says in uh, verse number 23, The Babylonians and the Chaldeans, Pekod, Shoah, Koa. Look, it notices. There's tons of different nations that are coming against them. And then... Uh, Verse number 24, and they shall come against thee with chariots, wagons, and wheels. So notice it's an army that's coming against them. Verse 26, look down. They shall also strip thee out of thy clothes and take away thy fair jewels. Thus will I make thy lewdness to cease from thee and thy whoredom brought from the land of Egypt. So, so that thou shalt not lift up thine eyes unto them, nor remember Egypt anymore. He says again in verse number 29, and they shall deal with thee hatefully. And what does it say about the kings? They shall hate the whore. Remember that? They shall hate the whore. It says right here. And they shall deal with thee hatefully and shall take away all thy labor and shall leave thee naked and bare and, and the nakedness of thy whoredoms shall be discovered. Both thy lewdness and thy whoredoms. And what's the reason why? Verse number 30. I will do these things unto thee because thou hast gone a whoring after the heathen and because thou art polluted with their idols. Look at what it says in verse 31 as well. Thou, wast, thou hast walked in the way of thy sister, therefore will I give her cup into thine hand. What did the whore have in her hand? A cup filled with the filthiness of her fornication. And what is it talking about right here? Her fornication. She's worshiping idols. Have you turned, uh, the pastor I was going to have you turn to just a moment ago, which is Jeremiah chapter number 7, verse number 33. So get that in your left hand. Jeremiah chapter number 7, verse number 33. Jeremiah chapter number 7, verse number 33. And I want you to get in your right hand, Revelation chapter number 18, verse number 22. Revelation chapter number 18, verse number 22, says this about the great whore of Babylon when it's destroyed. And the voice of harpers and musicians and of pipers and trumpeteers shall be heard no more at all in thee. And no craftsman of whatsoever craft he be shall be found any more in thee. And the sound of a millstone shall be heard no more at all in thee, and the light of a candle 
shall shine no more at all in thee, and the voice of the bridegroom and of the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee. For thy merchants were the great men of the earth, for by thy sorceries were all nations deceived. This is actually a quotation from the Old Testament. I want you to look at Jeremiah chapter number 7. Look at verse number 33. And the carcasses of this people shall be meat for the fowls of the heaven. This is speaking about Jerusalem. If you look at 29, verse 29, it says, Cut off thine hair, O Jerusalem, and cast it away. Speaking to her as though she is a whore. It says in verse uh, 34, Then will I cause to cease. This is a future event. Then will I cause to cease from the cities of Judah and from the streets of America, of the United States. And from the streets of Jerusalem, the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, for the land shall be desolate. So we have the punishment that God is going to bring upon Jerusalem in the Old Testament in the context of her being a whore. He's going to burn her. He's going to do this by having kings come against her. She's going to be burned. She's going to be made naked. She's going to be made desolate. We go to the New Testament. The only other time someone is being spoken of as being a whore, and what happens? God says he's going to send kings there, and they're going to hate her, they're going to make her naked, they're going to make her desolate, and they're going to burn her. And what does it say about the companies and the nations? They're going to deal hatefully with you. Right. Then we look at when they're destroyed, and it tells you he's going to call, and you know, at that time, there's not going to be a bridegroom, there's going to be no voices of mirth. You look that passage up, and it's a fulfilled prophecy about the, about the nation of Israel or the city specifically of Jerusalem. Amen. You see in the Old Testament, he says, there's going to be a time when I'm going to cause to cease the voice of mirth, happiness, the bride and the bridegroom, the trumpeteers, and it's fulfilled with the great whore. Right. There's no other option, my friend. Right. There's no other time when that's quoted. He says, there's going to be a time when I'm going to do this, and then it happens with the great whore. Ergo, Jerusalem is the great whore. Amen. How is Jerusalem destroyed? Fire, burn. The company comes against them. They hate her. She's made naked and desolate. How is the great whore destroyed? Fire, she's burned. They hate her. It's made naked and desolate. Come on. you got to take your blinders off. Amen. It's clear. That's right. It's super clear. Who's the only nation that's killed the apostles? Jerusalem. Where does Jesus say every prophet or where a prophet has to die? Jerusalem. What does the great whore do? She kills the prophets. She kills the apostles. What is Jerusalem referred to as in the book of Revelation? That great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. It's called Sodom and Egypt. You look in Isaiah chapter 1 where I read earlier, and it says... How is the faithful city becoming harlot? You know what it calls the city a few verses later? It's like Sodom. It's like Sodom. Did you notice just a moment ago we're reading Ezekiel, what another thing he said? He said it's like the wickedness you brought from Egypt. It's just like, it's like a mountain of evidence. It's just like super clear. Prophecies about the Old Testament, how he's going to destroy Jerusalem are fulfilled through the great war. Exactly how he's going to do it is fulfilled through the great war. The things that are going to happen when he does it, it's just like mountains upon mountains upon mountains of evidence. <clears throat> Isaiah, uh, uh, actually, I'm going to have you turn. I want you to look at this too. Go to Jeremiah chapter 16, verse 16. Jeremiah chapter number 16, verse 16. If you still have your hand there in Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter number 16, verse number 16. Jeremiah 16, 16. It says this. Behold, I will send for many fishers, saith the Lord, and they shall fish them. And afterward will I send for many hunters, and they shall hunt them from every mountain and from every hill and out of the holes of the rocks. Verse 17, watch this. For mine eyes are upon all their ways. He's saying, I see their wickedness. They are not hid from my face, neither is their iniquity hid from mine eyes. Look at verse 18. And first I will recompense their iniquity and their sin double. You see that? He says, I'm going to re recompense your sin double. And your iniquity double. Look at the context of speaking to Jerusalem. You can figure that out if you want to uh, you know, write this down and look at it later. But he says he's going to recompense their sin and their iniquity double. Revelation chapter number 18, it's verse number 6, says this. Reward her even as she rewarded you, and double unto her double, according to her works. And the cup which she hath filled, filled to her 
double. Isaiah chapter number 40, verse number 2 says this, Speak ye comfortable to Jerusalem, Jerusalem, comfortably to Jerusalem, and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished. Now listen, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she hath received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Double for all her sins. God says, hey, Jerusalem, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to destroy you, and I'm going to give you double for all your sins. Hey, the great whore, guess what? I'm going to fill unto you double. Amen. Fill unto her the cup that she hath filled. Fill it twice and punish her twice for what she's done. Kind of sound familiar? What did, God, what did Jesus say unto Jerusalem? He says that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth. Just fill up the wrath as much as you possibly can. And people want to say, God bless Israel. You better watch out. Blessing a, na a nation like that that God says, I'm going to bring my wrath upon this nation more than I've ever destroyed a nation in the whole history of mankind. God bless Israel. Are you kidding me? I mean, seriously, talk about spitting in God's face. Those people hate the Lord Jesus Christ. They don't love Christianity. They don't love Jesus. Their holy book that they hold higher than the Old Testament scriptures says that the Lord Jesus Christ, your Savior and your Messiah, is burning in a vat of excrement right now. Right. You want to say, bless those people? Are you kidding me? Right. Yeah, there are innocent people that are confused and that don't know what they're doing, but the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees still are alive today, and God says, you know, punish them double. Right. The wrath right. has come upon them to the uttermost. Amen. Yeah. That's not a nation to be blessing. Right. Right. In the Old Testament, uh, when Jehoshaphat goes out and helps, and it's, you know, I, I believe I'm almost positive it's the nation of Israel. He goes out and helps, or maybe he's from the nation of Israel. He goes out and helps someone that is God's enemy. And he's told very clearly that you should not help God's enemy. I was going to quote the verse, but it just slipped me. Does anybody know the first couple words? Shouldst thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Should you help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Therefore is wrath upon thee from before the Lord thy God. You'll be punished. You want to bless them? Well, you're going to, you're, people say, oh, you bless them. God will bless you. No, you bless them. God will punish you. God will give you a punishment is what he'll do. You don't bless and, 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 and hope for the good of those that hate the Lord. Right. You know, you talk about the one religion that is against the Lord Jesus Christ the most. It's called the synagogue of Satan. The synagogue of Satan. Paul, the, the whole New Testament. I don't know how you can read the New Testament and walk away thinking, well, Israel's God's chosen people. <laughs> Literally, in Philippians chapter number 3, I believe, Paul says, beware of, of the concision. For ye are the circumcision which worship God. He says, beware of dogs. And then in the same way, he says, beware of the concision. Talking about the circumcision. Beware of the Jews. People like they're God's chosen people. You know, you, I, I, I think, uh, what, I can't remember the guy's name, but he said, you should love all things Jewish. You should just love all things Jewish. Like, what in the world? It's just weird. He said it makes him happy anytime he hears, you know, Hebrew music and stuff. You need to think and wash your mind with the, with the cleansing of the word of God, buddy. Amen. That's the synagogue of Satan. They hate. They're probably singing in Hebrew. They're probably singing about how much they hate Jesus. Right. You know, they're wicked and evil, and they're called the synagogue of Satan. And God's going to utterly, the wrath is going to come upon them to the uttermost. God's going to destroy them. We are not going to bless them. Right. There will be a cold day in hell before we ever have some stinking Israeli flag, you know, hanging in here. Amen. That will never happen. I would rip that thing down. You guys better not try anything like that. I know you would. That would never happen. Because, you know, see, that's, we would be cursed by God. We just start, you want to just start supporting Israel? You know, it's kind of funny well, all of a sudden when, when the United States of America starts going down harsh for when. All of a sudden, we want to start supporting Israel, and they, you know, the nation of Israel. You know, same exact time we were allowing abortion starts coming about years later. You know, the, the blessing of God is not upon, you know, the nation of America right now either. And it's not going to be as long as we're blessing these people that hate the Lord. <clears throat> turn in your Bibles to, uh, have you turn in your Bibles to Revelation 17, 4. Now, this is super important. Also in Jeremiah, just for, for uh, educational sake, Jeremiah chapter number 22, verse number 8 in the Old Testament, Jerusalem is referred to as a great city. And she's called whore and harlot numerous times. I mean, 40, 50 times probably. So go back to Revelation chapter number 17, verse number 4. Something else that's very important that a lot of people don't try to even focus on, they just ignore it, is the colors that the whore is wearing. 
It says in Revelation 17, verse number 3, it says, So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having the seven heads and ten horns. We're going to focus on the woman, verse 4. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of the abominations and filthiness of her app. If you ever use a Bible app, get your Bible app out and type in purple, scarlet, and gold. You know what it points you to? The Old Testament tabernacle. Every time. It points you to the temple. What, when, when the Antichrist comes, where does he go? Does he just start his own religion? Where does he go? goes to the temple. And he claims to be the, the Messiah. He claims to be the Christ. He doesn't reject the Old Testament. He's going to come here and he's going to say he's the fulfillment of Christ. And, Israel, and these, you know, the nation of Israel is waiting, supposedly, for their Christ and their Messiah to come. And you know what the, what they believe he's going to do? They, they say repeatedly the reason why Jesus was not the Christ was because he came here and he died and he did not fulfill the things that the Messiah is supposed to do. The Messiah is going to come and he's going to rule and reign and he's going to bring peace on the earth. Do you know who the Bible says is going to do that? The Antichrist. Those, that is exactly what the Antichrist is going to do. And they said Jesus was not the Christ, but the Christ coming. You know, that, it, does that kind of make it a little bit more fleshly, a little bit more real? And they're waiting for him to come. They're, they're building the temple. Jerusalem was just named the capital of Israel again. Did you guys know that? Just recently. You kidding me? They, they said that they're, at any time they're ready to start rebuilding the temple and prepare it. Once that temple's built, shortly thereafter... The Antichrist will show up. So here in Revelation 17, these colors that are given, they're the colors of the tabernacle of the Old Testament and the temple of the Old Testament. Turn to Exodus chapter number 25, verse number 4. I want to show you the clarity and the repetition of this. If you look at a couple of these within the same chapter, or within uh, the same book, just a couple of chapters from one another. Look at Exodus chapter number 25. <clears throat> Exodus chapter number 25. Look at verse number 3. And this is the offering which ye shall take of them, gold and silver and brass. This is the material that they're bringing for the tabernacle. Gold and silver and brass, look at this, and blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen and goat's hair and ram's skins dyed red and badger skins and shittim wood. So notice that badger skin too. That's going to be important here in just a moment. Exodus 26.1 says this, Moreover, thou shalt make the tabernacle with ten curtains of fine twined linen, and blue, and purple, and scarlet, with cherubims of cunning work, shalt thou make them. Look at Exodus 26, 31, same chapter. <clears throat> Exodus 26, 31, and thou shalt make a veil of blue, and purple, and scarlet, and fine twined linen of cunning work, with cherubims shall it be made. Look at 28, verse 5. Flip over, chapter 28, verse 5. And they shall take gold and blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen. Then he goes on to explain that the ephod is made that way as well. Look at 28, 33. Same chapter, verse 33. And beneath upon the hem of it, thou shalt make pomegranates of blue and of purple and of scarlet round about the hem thereof and the bells of gold between them round about. Notice the exact colors. The exact colors that the great whore has in the New Testament. The exact colors of the tabernacle of the Old Testament. And the exact colors when the tabernacle was done away with and the temple was built. The exact colors that, that was used for the temple. Uh, flip over to Exodus chapter number 39 verse 1 through 3. We're going to read again. This will be the last one which gives that description. Exodus chapter number 39. Look at verse 1. And of, the blue, and of the blue and purple and scarlet they made cloths of service to do service in the holy place. And made thy holy garments for Aaron... As the Lord commanded Moses. And he made the ephod of gold, blue, and purple, and scarlet, and fine twine linen. And they beat the gold into thin plates and cut it into wires to work it in the blue and in the purple and the scarlet and the fine linen. And with cutting work. Notice he keeps repeating this over and over and over and over and over again. This is the only other place where these colors are found. Here, and then the great whore is decked and array in these. What did John say? Come hither and I'll show thee. I'll show thee. But he's going to show her what? The great whore is that sits upon many waters. He starts giving them details about it. Hey, John, look what she's wearing. And then he gives her more details. We keep reading, hey, she's drunken with the blood of the saints. Who killed the saints? Who killed the prophets? Who killed the apostles? You know, what's very interesting is something else. Think about this. Before Jesus was crucified, they took Jesus, the Roman soldiers, they took Jesus, and they put Jesus in front of them. They were buffeting him. They were hitting him in the face. They were mocking him. They put a crown of thorns on his head, right? 
But they did something else. They arrayed him in something. Do you remember? Purple robe in one gospel. Do you know what it says in the other gospel? Scarlet. Purple and scarlet. Do you know what they called it? Hail. What? King of the Jews. Why did they put purple and scarlet on it? What's the color of the Jews? Hail, King of the Jews. Purple and scarlet. They're mocking him and acting like he's the King of the Jews, and they make sure they take that color robe, and they put that color robe on it. you know what color the great horse wearing? Purple and scarlet. Look at Revelation 17 one more time. I want to point out something to you. So, there are a few colors that were mentioned in that list just now. Can anybody name them off real quick? Okay, right. Blue, purple, uh, uh, scarlet, gold, right? Those are the four colors. Look at Revelation chapter number 17, verse number 4. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. What's missing? Blue. Blue is missing. Go back to Numbers chapter number 14. There's something, I believe it's 15 actually. There's something that's very, very, very significant about the color blue with the, with the tabernacle of the Old Testament. God implemented the color blue for a very important reason. Notice every time when they did something in the Old Testament, he said, hey, make it with blue and purple and scarlet and gold. And blue and purple and scarlet and gold. And when you see the great whore, what does she have? Purple and scarlet and gold. She's missing the blue. Why, is she, why did she leave off the blue? Look at the purpose of, number, of the blue here in Numbers chapter number 15. Verse number 37. It says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and bid them that they make them fringes in the borders of their garments throughout their generations. Throughout their generation. So should they still today have those borders if they're following this? They should, right? Throughout their generation. Throughout, and it says, and that, they may, and that they put upon the fringe of the borders a ribbon of blue. Now look at this. And it shall be unto you for a fringe, that you may look upon it and remember all the commandments of the Lord and do them, and that ye seek not after your own heart and your own eyes. That statement is always used when it's talked about them seeking after their own heart and going after other gods and other idols. That you seek not after your own heart and after your own eyes, after which you used to go a whoring. Notice that word right there. Do you know what it's talking about that you used to go a whoring after? Other idols. It's talking about them committing fornication. When the whore shows up, do you know what one color she doesn't have? Blue. She doesn't want to remind them. You know why? What was the serpent when he came in Genesis chapter number 3? What's his characteristic? He's more subtle than any beast of the field. Notice that subtle little difference, that subtle change. When the Antichrist shows up and he, and he goes to the city, John's trying to tell you something. It's just like the Old Testament tabernacle. It's just like, you know, like he's serving the God of Jehovah. The Antichrist shows up and what? He's, got on a white, he's wearing a white, he's riding a white horse. I'm the Christ. But there's a little difference. There's a little bit different, right? The blue is missing. Why? What's the purpose of the blue? That it may remind you not to go a whoring. If those Jews were still serving God today, if they were, which they're not, if you don't have the Son, you don't have the Father. He is the Father of the flesh. Amen. If you know, you know what they would do? They would see that whore and they'd say, What's going on here? Why are they missing the blue? Oh, Numbers 15. God, God warned us about this. Yes. So you see, when Satan comes, there's just a subtle difference. You know this should be a warning to us. Not to be tricked by Satan just in any area of life. Because he presents stuff. He doesn't. People have this wrong idea that he comes with a pitchfork. No, he doesn't. He comes like an angel of light. He comes and looks exactly like the real thing. But there's just a little difference. He comes and he's, you know, it looks like he's offering something good. Looks like he's offering something. He looks like he's coming as a preacher. He's coming as an angel of light, as I said. But he's not. Inward, inwardly, he's a ravening wolf. He looks like a sheep, but he's not. He's not there to help you. He's there to destroy you. And when he comes, he doesn't come holding a pitchfork. He doesn't come and you can't identify him clearly right away. He comes and there's just a slight difference. And you know when Jerusalem is set up and the Antichrist comes and all this starts to be fulfilled, a lot of people are going to be deceived. You say, why do you preach about something so stupid? 
This isn't stupid. This is, I believe the end times are coming very soon. And I think that this is very important that people are aware of this because many, the whole world is going to worship this man. The entire world is going to worship this one man. Think about that. <laughs> Satan in the flesh. And he's going to come to deceive. And he's very subtle. I want you to... I'm going to read to you real quick from... Go over to, to Jeremiah chapter number 4. Jeremiah chapter number 4. <clears throat> we'll compare this last... It's more of... No, this will be the last passage. I thought there was one other one that I had here. See, I got so much here, I kind of became cluttered. Jeremiah chapter number 4, look at verse number 10. Jeremiah chapter number 4, verse number 10. Then said I, Ah, Lord God, surely thou hast greatly deceived this people in Jerusalem, saying, You shall have peace, whereas the sword reacheth unto the soul. At that time shall it be said to this people, and at Jerusalem, and to Jerusalem, a dry wind of high places in the wilderness... Toward the daughter of my people, not to fan, nor to cleanse. Even a full wind from those places shall come unto me. I don't, th I don't think this is correct. No, this isn't right. Give me just one second. I, I had one other passage that I wanted you to turn to. Go to Ezekiel chapter number 16. That's what we'll do. Ezekiel chapter number 16. We'll end there. Ezekiel chapter number 16, verse number 10. I'm going to read to you from Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 30. There is one verse in here I'm going to read to you. Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 30 says this, And when thou art spoiled, talking to Jerusalem, what wilt thou do? Though thou closest thyself with crimson. What color is crimson? Red. 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 What color is scarlet? Red. Red. They're actually used interchangeably in the famous verse in, in, in Isaiah chapter 1. He says, Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as wool. He says, Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as snow. So notice, crimson and scarlet are the same color. He says right here, though thou deckest, thy, though thou closest thyself with crimson, the great four, Jerusalem clothed in crimson, clothed in scarlet. Though thou deckest thee with ornaments of gold, though thou rentest thy face with painting, in vain shall they make thyself fair. And he says, thy lovers will despise thee; they will seek thy life. The lovers will hate them. It's the ten kings that comes against them and destroys them. Um, I want you to look here at Ezekiel chapter number sixteen, verse number ten again. The description will end here. A very clear description where God prophesied about this. Even at the time of Ezekiel, he prophesied of the great whore, Jerusalem, being destroyed in the end times. Ezekiel chapter number 16, verse number 10, he says, I clothed thee also with broidered work and shod thee with badger skins. Now that is super significant. He's speaking to Jerusalem and he's calling her a whore and a harlot and he's telling you what she's wearing. And notice what he, what he says she's arrayed in. Badger skins. Do you know why he says that? I noticed it and I pointed it out earlier. I, I, I uh, tried to make note of it earlier and pointed it out. Because that's what the, the Old Testament tabernacle is, was, was used. They put badger skins on the Old Testament tabernacle. In the list of the blue and scarlet and the purple is badger skins. When God in the Old Testament talks about Jerusalem being a whore at that time, he says, I clothe you. And I clothed you, and I, and I uh, clothed you with badger skins. One of the things he says. Keep reading. And I girded thee about with fine linen, and I covered thee with silk. I decked thee also with ornaments, and I put bracelets upon thy hands and a chain on thy neck. And I put a jewel. Look at this. I put a jewel on thy forehead, and earrings in thine ears, and and a beautiful crown upon thine head. Thus wast thou decked with gold and silver, and thy raiment was of fine linen and silk embroidered work. Thou didst eat fine flour and honey and oil, and thou wast exceeding beautiful, and thou didst prosper into a kingdom. And thy renown went forth among the heathen for thy beauty, for it was perfect through, through the, my comeliness. So notice, why does she look the way that she looked? Because God gave her these colors. God's the one who gave her the purple and the scarlet and the badger skin and the gold and the bracelets and the ornaments. He said it's through my comeliness because I'm the one that girded you. Look at what it says next. Which I have put upon thee, saith the Lord God. Verse 15. But thou didst trust in thine own beauty and playest the harlot because of thy renown and pourest out thy fornications on everyone that passeth by. His it was. What is the, what is the great whore doing in the New Testament? Commits fornication with all the kings of the earth. Everyone that passeth by and of thy garments thou didst take and deck, deckest thy high places with divers colors. And place the harlot thereupon, the like things shall not come, neither shall it be so. 
Thou hast also taken thy fair jewels, and of and he says, of my gold and of my silver, which I have given thee, and made and madest to thyself images of man, and it says, and this commit whoredom with them. There is evidence upon evidence upon evidence of who Jerusalem is. Really, that you only need one. Because it tells you the great whore killed the apostles. Right. That is irrefutable. Yeah. And the Lord Jesus Christ says that he's purposely going to send all the apostles to Jerusalem. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets. We can identify the great whore by prophecies that were prophesied about Jerusalem from the Old Testament. They're fulfilled through the great whore. What's going to happen after she's destroyed? The way that she's destroyed. The fact that the great whore killed the apostles, killed the, 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 the prophets, the saints. The fact that Jerusalem did all of those things. The colors of the great whore. The list goes on and on and on. I didn't even, even include all of it here. The song of Moses is sang right before they start pouring out the plagues. And what do they say? Come out of her, my people, that thou receive not of her plagues. What's the purpose of the plagues? To punish Jerusalem? To punish the great whore? And right before the plagues are poured out, they sing the song that was meant to be a testimony against the, the descendants of the nation of Israel. And they're not the real people. They're not the real nation. All those in heaven that are singing. That's a cool thought, that we're going to be able to see this destruction. We're going to be in heaven, and we're going to sing that song, the song of Moses. Amen. We're going to be singing the song of Moses because we're the true Israel. Right. And that nation over there is not the people of God. Amen. They are not the people of God like the Bible says. They which are born after the flesh, these are not the people of God. Right. They're the synagogue of Satan, my friend. Right. And people need to wake up. From this, 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 this praise of Israel, this praise of Judaism, this praise of just the, the Jewish people as though they are the children of God. They're not the children of God. Right. The children of the, of the promise, they're counted for the seed. Those are the children of God. And you know what's going to happen? They're going to begin again persecuting the saints in the end times. They're going to start chopping people's heads off. And you need to be aware of where this is going to come from. You know, imagine not knowing and you're still in the city. And God gives a warning about right at that time when the, when the abomination of desolation is shut up, is, is uh, set up. He tells you, hey, get out of the city. Flee. Don't even turn around and go get your clothes and your things. You tell me this isn't important to know who this is? And God said, you know, it, it, God told John through the angels, so he sent his servant, and he says, come with me, I'll show you the bride, the lamb's wife, right? Who was it? New Jerusalem. You see the parallel. Come with me and I'll show you the judgment of the great whore. And who is it? It's that great city. Revelation chapter number 11, verse number, verse number 4, I believe, tells you. Their dead bodies are going to lie in the streets of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord is crucified. The great city, that great city, the great whore, mystery Babylon, is Jerusalem, which now is. So we need to keep our eyes, now that we know biblical prophecy, not from a newspaper, not from CNN, not by looking at current events, not by reading a history book about the Roman Catholic Church, but allowing the Bible to interpret the Bible. Allowing the Holy Spirit to tell us who the great whore is. And it's Jerusalem. That is who the great whore is. Mystery unraveled by the, by the Bible itself. Amen. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father God, we thank you, dear Lord, for the revelations. We know that you tell us these things so that because you love us and so that we can protect ourselves and so that we can uh, stay out of danger, dear Lord. God, help us to stand strong, dear Lord. Help us to continually read the Bible and help us to understand that all of the Bible matters, uh, and especially uh, in times, events, and even more so to those that will most likely be alive when it takes place. We ask you that you would keep us safe during this time, dear Lord God, and that we can stand against the wickedness of Jerusalem and of uh, those that say they are Jews and are not of the nation of Israel, that we could preach against them, dear Lord God, and that we would stand for the true nation of Israel and for the true covenant of God, which is found in the Lord Jesus Christ. We love you so much. And in Jesus Christ's name, amen. amen.